Crossing borders is what I will be talking with you about this afternoon. And that will take the rest of the evening because I have a very long life, although it seems short. But I am happy to tell you that I have led the most incredible, the most interesting life. I grew up in Finland, so I'm Finnish by birth. I speak Finnish. Um, I know um, some German, French, a little bit of Japanese, a little bit of Swedish, etc. The point being that I have grown up with languages and issues that have to do with language all of my life. I lived in the United States. I've lived in uh, Japan a couple different times, and so my whole life has been a story of crossing borders, cultural, linguistic, ethnic, political, and so forth. But today, I am not here to tell you what an incredible life I've had and tell you all the different stories that I could about it, but I will share one time and one episode within my life that concerns all of us who are here today. And it may sound uh, far uh, and remote, very ro remotely removed from me, and English is my uh, foreign language, and I was in Pyhikulla Suomeksi, tai ehkä Englanniksi, tai Nihongo Temo Itiskelo. Let's continue with uh, English nonetheless. So the big event that I wish to talk to you about is something that happened actually um, about 10 years ago. So it's a 10-year anniversary of a very, very significant event in the world that the general public, for the most part, knows very little, if anything, about. And that event is that ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, which is a UN arm, decided after a five-year-long study to say that English is and must be the language of global aviation. Did you know that English was not the language of global aviation until 10 years ago. That's really a pretty scary thing to think about. English has been spoken in the skies in terms of aviation uh, phraseology. Pilots and air traffic controllers use it, and I'll tell you more about that later. But the, what I'd like you to keep in mind right now is that from 2003, there has been a mandate within global aviation that concerns all pilots and all air traffic controllers that cross, again, linguistic or national boundaries, who happen to come in contact with crews from other countries and, and other nations, they need to be able to fall back on a common language, and that is English. So English is the language of aviation, and everyone involved must know it. Communication, in general, is very dependent on the fact whether we understand one another's messages or not. Communication is you telling me something, me trying to process what you've said and saying it back. And many of you know from home, talking to your spouses or to your children, that we very often say, what do you mean? What do you mean? And we speak the same language and we live in the same family. And yet we don't understand one another. And here we're talking about a situation and a context that is very, very safety cautious, crucial, because we are flying planes or we're taxiing on the ground where there's other traffic. So we must be successful with communication. And the communication success here in aviation depends on understanding the jargon, understanding the professional language that pilots and controllers use among themselves. And we call that a jargon and that phraseology that I will uh, talk to you about just momentarily. And it understands, depends on understanding standard procedures for standard situations. And we hope that everything remains standard. However, life is often not standard. All sorts of things happen out of the blue, things we don't expect. And if you think about your day to day, it may not have been standard in every way you would have liked it to. Something didn't work, you had a runner in your stocking, you had the wrong thing for breakfast, you got the phone call at the wrong time, you were late. Life happens, it happens all the time. And in aviation, it is scary when life happens. And yet people are operating large machinery, so therefore, it is extremely important that we're focused people involved in this are focused. And why do I say we? Because life happened to me in 1996. I married a flight school owner, and the flight school was located in Southern California. And I became involved with pilots 
air traffic controllers, aircraft of all kinds, airplanes, helicopters. It was a brand new world to me. I'd crossed into a world I didn't understand at all. But what I did understand was it was very interesting and it was very cool and it was so fun to go up on the rides when I could just sit there and say, this is a lot of fun. I don't have to do anything except try to look nice and wave and hope that my neighbors can see me, although you're often too high and you can't wave at anybody. But anyway, so here I am at Maximum Energy Air um, and getting very interested in, uh, in aviation all in all because it's all around me. And there were many international students at our school. And uh, that's a good thing. It's, it's, it's excellent to have this uh, exchange between countries and so forth. But what was really curious and what began to bother me was that when I would talk to these international students and go and introduce myself, say, hello, my name is Mario. How are you doing? And the answer would be, I'm fine, thank you. My name is so and so. And then I turn back and say, well, maybe could you tell me um, why are you interested in becoming a pilot? excuse me, and the person would run away. I thought, surely I don't have that effect on everybody, but turns out it was the language. It was a language issue, and this person could not understand what I was saying beyond hello, how are you, I'm fine, and you. Sort of the um, junior high school level uh, language lesson. So. <clears throat> Because I am concerned, I go into the federal aviation regulations to see what do the regulations really say about English ability within this context. And the federal aviation regulations within the United States read just what it says on the screen. Pilots must be able to read, write, speak, and understand English. And I'm going, yes, there's the point. It's case closed. This is done. People have to know English. But if you think of these four skills, they're all very different. Writing, reading, speaking, listening, they're all very different skills. And of all of these four, let's take a quick vote here. How important do you think is reading? If you think it's very important, yell loudly, yes. Reading. Yes. Okay, writing. Yes. Speaking. Yes. Oh, you're smart. <laughs> Understanding. Yes, these last two things, speaking and understanding, are the most crucial things one has to be able to do when you're having a communications within the cockpit. So, then the next question, and here I am, I'm an applied linguist by training. Besides all the travel and the languages that I've learned, my, my professional training is, is in language teaching, second language acquisition, so this is what I know how to do. I know how to assess people, I know what language standards are. So I wanted to read further in the regulations. What does it mean to have to be able to speak and understand English? Speak to what level? Speak to whom? Speak in which context? Does one need to be able to recite Shakespeare? Or does one need to be able to give a college presentation in English? And the answer is no. You have to be able to understand what's going on at any given time when someone is speaking to you within the context of flying, right? And the same thing is true with the test. I wanted to know, well, how does in this case, the FAA know if a person has mastered English. Well, there is no way, except when you go to take a medical exam at the um, uh, medical licensor's office to find out that you're healthy enough to fly. And so they take all of the routine tests, listen to your heart, this, that, and the other. And the doctor has a form in his uh, hand, which he's filling out and he is uh, checking a box on the bottom of his form that says, can speak and understand English. At the doctor's office. How is that related to flying? And how good are you going to be with your English when your pants are down and you're being all nervous anyway? says, do I know English? I don't know anything if that's my case. That's not a good place to check if somebody's English is good enough. Or if you're flying and you're, and you're um, uh, instructor is talking to you, when I decided to take lessons, I came to the conclusion that when my instructor was speaking to me, I needed to be able to just wait and sit still and have him have the controls and say, just talk to me. I can't do this and listen and learn everything at the same time. It was a, was a lot of work. So 
when I finally understood that there, there is a real issue here, pilots, and again, I'm speaking from the pilot perspective, are, are supposed to know how to speak and understand English, but nobody knows to what, what degree, what ability, what proficiency level, and nobody knows how to test it. And so my thought was, <laughs> we've done this in my profession for decades, for a long, 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 long time. Why don't we bring these together? Why don't we bring people from language teaching and learning and, and the aviation folks together to talk about this? Because it's surely a big issue and seems to uh, concern everybody's safety in uh, global aviation as far as I'm concerned, especially when these planes were flying over my own house. It seemed like an important thing. But the thing is, how does one change international law? How do you do that? I don't know how to do that. So I'm in Southern California at a non-towered airport trying to figure out how to go about this humongous issue. I had no idea except to say, please God, this is way bigger than me. And uh, I am going backwards. Let's go forward. Here we are. And I did um, decide that the only thing I could do was to keep learning and learn about the issue more, talk to anybody and everybody who knew, who understood, go to the places where this was being discussed and try to start spreading awareness. And that's where I started flight training. I understood that as a linguist, I could go to many different aviation events and the, the retired military type were not going to listen to some blonde talk about what they're supposed to do in the cockpit if she doesn't even fly. So I decided I had to learn how to fly. And that was the most exciting and the most awful and scary thing I've ever done in my entire life. But I did it. I did earn a license. And I do know that you have to be able to use ATC phraseology. And that's a memorized set of phrases that pilots and controllers use between themselves. It's concise, to the point. There's no extra, hello, how's it going? What's happening in your life? No chit chat. It's all about what's happening and it's very quick and short. But it takes a while to learn that. And so regardless of your language background, all of us have to memorize this uh, phraseology. And in my case, I remember a particular time I'm flying around our airport for the first time by myself and my instructor, whose name is Morton, is down on the ground with a handheld radio. And I'm up in the sky coming in for a landing at our airport and the baby pilot I am, I see I am way too high. I see the runway way over there and I know that I'm not at the right altitude. I need to do something in order to come down lower to make my landing. But I don't know how to operate the plane well enough at that point. And so I'm completely confused, can't remember anything about phraseology. I barely managed the plane. And so I thought, okay, what am I gonna do? I need to let my instructor know that I'm okay, but that I also need to tell him I'm not ready to come in for a landing. So I click on the radio and everybody on the same radio wave can hear me. And so I'm going, Martin, that's his name, Martin. Cessna 39-393, yes. Martin, I'll be right back. <laughs> and I turn the plane around and go and do a big 360 one of these and finally come back at the right altitude. But was that ever embarrassing? Because some of the other people had heard me too and go, uh -huh, you did come right back, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> other times, something similar. Uh, flew to um, Las Vegas and uh, the uh, air traffic controller says to me, um, I'm on the controls, he says, I hear something like Cessna 393993, do you see jet stream? And I'm thinking of this white stuff that planes leave behind them in the sky and I'm looking for jet stream and I key my radio in and say, negative, no jet stream. And my instructor gets right back on and says, affirmative, in sight. And they were talking about jet stream Airplane. It's a. It's a. Um, I'm thinking in Finnish right now. This is what happens if you're not uh, communicatively competent. And this is what the aviation law is about. That you need to be able to think on your feet and explain your situation. But it, it is an airplane called Jetstream, and I didn't know that. 
But through practicing, through talking, through finding out who is interested in this issue, the same issue that I am, I, I met a woman within the FAA, a safety program manager, who was also concerned about communication issues. She took me under her wing and would take me to every possible safety event that happened in the United States. And interestingly enough, enough uh, in 2000, we won an award from the United States government for an initiative in safety, which is not why I, I got into this. There was no money, no fame. It was just hard work. But I felt compelled to do something. And a result of that, the FAA sent me to ICAO, the group I talked to you about earlier, the UN arm, to be part of a group. It was called the Bryce Group. Multidisciplinary, multilingual, international, was all stakeholders involved, and the common goal was to create a standard for pilots and controllers in aviation. And this is the model that we came up with. And that is that yes, the air traffic control phraseology is absolutely important. It's a must at all times. That's what you should use to keep things simple. But when something happens, when life interferes, when you don't know what to say, or something unusual is going on, then you need to be able to fall back down on the safety net of this plain language. And the exciting thing was that, as I said at the beginning, 198 nations in 2003 signed this mandate into a law and said yes. We believe in this. We don't care about our national pride. We don't care that it's not our language that we're not using. English happens to be the lingua franca of the world today, whether we like it or not, it just is. And it was already used for ATC phraseology. And the operational level means pilots and controllers are safe to operate planes when they speak and understand at the operational level. And the proudest thing for me about this standard is that it was written for both native speakers and non-native speakers. It's not okay for native speakers in the London accent or in, their, in the Cogni accent or in the Alabama accent to confuse foreign pilots who don't understand what they're saying. So they too, need to come to the same standard because everyone cares about everyone else in this community and we try to make communication doable. So crossing borders, whichever way it is, it's, it's uh, hard work and safety is absolutely the key. But my question to you today is, what are the borders that you might need to cross? What is the calling on your life? For me, aviation English came at a, at a juncture where my background and a problem that I became aware of, of intermingled and met somehow, and I felt I had to do something, didn't know how, but it happened. And 10 years later, this law is still in place. So what's your calling? What is the big question? What is it that's eating at you, gnawing at you? Because that is what you need to pursue. And you can do it because nothing is impossible when we're in it together.